sequence and what I've been doing. But on this Saturday, <coughs> I wasn't ready, so I was going to finish up the book, uh, not finish up, but uh, continue in the book of Revelation that we've been studying. Uh, when the last trumpet sounds in Revelation 11, 15 through 19. Now, uh, in chapter 11 here, <coughs> we've come to the latter part of chapter 11. <coughs> and in this part, uh, we come to the part where the scripture starts to introduce the second coming of Christ. This is the seventh trumpet. And when the seventh trumpet sounds, that means the coming of Christ is really close. So uh, we're going we're gonna to read the uh, chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. And then I'll try to kind of explain it as we go through it. So 11 15 it says, And the seventh angel sounded, which is that last trumpet, Christ is coming, as I said, and there will be great, uh, great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Also in Isaiah 27 13. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worship God. Uh, now, verse 17, 17, um, uh, we see, uh, <coughs> is starting to, is going to be talking about the millennial period. Really, from 17 through 18, we get what we call uh, the doctrine of the gap. Uh, the whole millennial period, the thousand-year reign, goes by. Uh, in these two in these two verses, uh, we see the millennial reign in verse 17. We give the thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come. Now, art to come is in in the original Greek, but Thou hast they stuck it in there to help us help explain it. But Thou hast taken to Thee Thy great power and hast reigned. Here he is he's taken the earth back. We're, we'll talk about that. He's, he's taken the earth back. The deed to this title deed to this earth back. And so we see he's going to set up his millennial kingdom. And then verse 18. And the nations were angry, and they wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged. We see the white throne judgment is, is coming up. This is all the way to the end. The whole millennial period goes. you got that gap in there from one to the end. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy which shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testimony. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and the earth and, and an earthquake and great hail. <clears throat> so you see the white throne judgment, all that coming into that gap. That's all it is. God uh, the doctrine of the gap, that's all it is. It just jumps all the way to the end of time. Now, to understand the scripture, we're going to um, look, look at, at some, some basic, basic things, things and some basic, basic principles, principles we need to really to understand uh, this whole chapter, if we're going to deal with it and what's going on now. Understand, Satan is the ruler of this world. Now, we're going to talk a lot about Satan, so hopefully we don't get any problems with the uh, <coughs> sound and everything like that we usually do. Now, Satan is the ruler of this world. Now, as the ruler of this world, he has the right uh, to give it to anyone and uh, he, that he wants to give it to. Now, he offered it to Christ in Matthew 4, 8, 8 through 9, uh, and he had a bona fide offer. Uh, takes him up on the mountain and offers him all the kingdoms of the world in Matthew uh, uh, chapter 4, verses 8 through 9. And he had a right to do that. Also, in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says... <laughs> Satan, the god of this world, has blinded mankind. So Satan is considered the god of the god of this world and all the kingdoms of the world. So he had the right to offer that to Christ because he is. Now, he is saying, I'll offer you all the kingdoms of the world and give you all of this, Jesus, if you will worship me. I will give it to you now. Now, Jesus says no. He says, oh, no, I'm not going to take it. I will win it at the cross. The devil all through the Bible has really never wanted the cross to happen because he knew it would provide salvation. Now, he, is, he doesn't know everything is in omniscience, 
But he does have an idea. He does know some things that are going on, and he does not want that to happen. So he's been fighting that for quite a while. From the Garden of Eden, the devil has fought every foot of the cross. He said, I'll give you the crown, a valid offer. I don't mind giving you the crown now. But Jesus said, no. I'm going to wear the crown, but I'll win it at the cross and not let you give it to me now. So Satan is offering Christ the world. Now let's go back back to Revelation. Satan, this is where some people get, get kind of upset, but Satan is in the business of doing good, or the good he is really capable of doing. Now, he's also in the business of doing bad. Yes, we were brought up and Satan is in the business of doing bad. I'm not saying that. He is in the business of doing evil. All evil is, is done by Satan. But he also is in the business of doing some good. You see, if Satan can bring in perfect environment, which is a perfect world, then Christ doesn't have to come back. See? There would be no need for it. There would be no need for the cross. If, if we would do, if we, well, if we never sinned, if never sin happened, then we wouldn't have this. If, if Adam and Eve had now not sinned in the garden, we wouldn't have what we have now. So that wouldn't have to happen. So when he tries to bring in perfect garment, uh, environment, then he would be bringing in the millennium himself and not Christ. Evil, in some cases, some of the real real evil people of this world are an embarrassment to Satan. Because when we look at that, we say, look at all this evil, like, like, like Hitler and that. We're like, oh, we don't want that if that's what, what it's all about. We don't want it. So in a way, Hitler and Mussolini and Mao Zedong, all of them were kind of an embarrassment to him. Uh, I don't know, most of you don't remember Madeleine O'Hara, uh, but she was kind of an embarrassment. But her son became saved and going around telling everybody that Mama was wrong. So evil can't embarrass him because he doesn't want you to see it that way. He wants you to see that his way is the best way. So even though he he's created evil, he's not there. You see, Satan is behind communism and socialism. Why? Because both communism and socialism is trying to bring in a perfect world or perfect environment. And he doesn't like that. Uh, and he wants that in there. That's what he wants to do. He wants to bring in that, that perfect environment, that perfect world, uh, so that uh, so that Christ doesn't have to come because he's already put it in. So, so that's why, in a way, he's in the do-good business because he's trying to bring in that thing. He's behind all those. And he says, I'll bring in a program that says we don't need to worship God. My way is the better way. You see, and he gets us, mankind, he gets us, that man's efforts can do all the good they can to bring in and produce a world that is good that it makes unnecessary for Christ. You see, if he can get you to believe that giving to the poor, which is good, don't get me wrong, and doing this and not... And, and do all these good works and do all this good stuff and be nice to people and bring in a world that's equal and and that if he can get you to believe that that all the good works that your good works will outweigh weigh your bad that you're going to get to heaven he's got you so you see in some cases Satan is in the good do good business in a way of deceiving you he does the good not for your benefit but for your downfall, for your negativeness. In other words, you see, if we can do that, then he's trying to stop the cross or for Christ even to come back and set up his millennial kingdom. So <clears throat> Christ said, no, Satan, your plan isn't going to work. I'm not going to go by your plan. Your program is wrong. I'm going to win the cross at Calvary. Now, in the middle of tribulation, a man called the dictator of the revived Roman Empire says, I'll accept your offer, Satan. I will become the ruler of this world. And he does for a short period of time. Satan offers it to him and he accepts his offer. And he becomes the ruler of this world for that short period of time. But he doesn't quite going to make it. 
He's not going to quite make it, you see, because Jesus Christ at the right moment, just like at the right time, Galatians 4 tells us that he came, took on the form of a human being and in a child and lived for 33 years here. Well, at the right time, at his timing, the right moment, he's going to return and, and is going, going to reign, reign and set up his millennial kingdom, we call it, and reign for a thousand years. Now, that's what Christ is going to do. Now, Satan's plan for ruling the world, but like always, he comes, he's too short. He doesn't quite make it with this dictator of the Roman Empire that he's trying to rule the world. He's always a little late in coming with his program. He never takes over control of the world for very long and be worshipped. Now, number two, Jesus prayed, Thy kingdom come in Matthew 6, the disciples' prayer. Um, this prayer when it says thy kingdom come really has nothing to do with, with the kingdom. It has to do with the millennial kingdom. And his kingdom is not going to come to this earth through the church until the church is taken away. The church mission and all the work that we do, it only comes. It doesn't come by the work of the church. All the evangelism we do, all the good work, it doesn't bring his kingdom in. It only comes when Christ comes back himself and Zechariah and stands and splits on the Mount, on the Mount of Olives. When he comes back, Satan's will is now being done on this earth and will be done by the majority of the people. It says in the Bible that narrow is the gate to heaven and broad is the road uh, to destruction or hell. And Satan, for the majority of the people, uh, his will is going to be done till Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom. And then all that's going to end at the end of the tribulation period. But right now, a lot of his will is being done and not God's in this world. And we, we see that today. We're not oblivious to it. I mean, we'd have to be pretty blind not, not, not to see that happening today. So doing this, let me look at, look, let's look at the kingdom. I want to give about seven points on the kingdom, the millennial, the millennial reign of Christ, really, uh, that thousand-year reign. And number one, the kingdom is promised. Now, that's the first thing we have. And we have to go back to uh, 2 Samuel uh <coughs> chapter 7 in verses 12 through 16 and let me start and when thy days be fulfilled he's talking to David and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers I will set up thy seed after thee which shall proceed out of thy bowels and I will establish his kingdom now he's talking about about Solomon Solomon's the kingdom he shall build a house for my name Solomon and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chastise him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy, in verse 50, shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom, talking about the Vedic covenant, shall be established forever before thee, Thy throne shall be established forever. Now, he's talking, uh, God's talking to David and about Solomon. The kingdom is coming, uh, and a greater son is going to be born. It's going to be forever, and that is going to be Christ. David's greater son is going to reign as king. So the kingdom is promised. Okay, now stick with me. The kingdom was prophesied. Now that we have to go to Isaiah chapter 2 in verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the hills, and all nations shall follow unto it. And my people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go to the mountain <coughs> of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Coughing, that's probably coming because we're talking about Satan. Mm -hmm. To the house of the God of Jacob, and he shall teach us his ways, and will we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. 
this is also Jeremiah 50, uh, verse 5. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. So we have, to, we have it promised in, in, in Samuel, in the Davianic covenant, the covenant, and now we have it prophesied. And, and, and this is probably one of the good things. I could have given you more. And Christ comes back and sets up that claim. You could go to Isaiah 35, Isaiah 65, 66, and Zechariah. We, we can just go out there. There's many passages that show that, that the kingdom was prophesied and also promised. So third, we have the kingdom was presented. Now, Christ came to the earth, and for three years he told them that he was their king, and they didn't recognize him. A few did. His entry into Jerusalem, they said, uh, take your kingdom back. Praise it. Hosanna, the king. Take your kingdom now. They wanted Jesus to take his kingdom now. They recognized him as a king. Save us. Take your kingdom now. Save us from this Roman Empire. But Jesus said, I have come to present the kingdom, but I'm not going to rule on a throne now, but from a cross. And they couldn't get that. They couldn't understand that. How could this happen? They didn't understand all this. They just wanted the kingdom now. So he presented it to them, but they weren't ready for it. But are you ready for it? They were not ready for it, Israel, but are you ready for it? Are you ready for the kingdom? Are you ready for it to come? You know, for us believers like me, I'm looking forward to the rapture. Yeah, it says I'm waiting for the kingdom. Well, I want the rapture and then come with him and set up his kingdom. So I'm waiting for the rapture. But are you ready for God to come back and judge? Are you really ready for that? You see, if you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you're not ready for the kingdom to come at all. You're not, you're not ready, ready for the seven, seven years to start living up to it. You're not ready. But you need to be ready. Now, four, I better go on, not rabbit trail so much. The kingdom was postponed, as I said. Christ presented it. They said no. They did not recognize it. So it was postponed because during this time, when you read about Christ's life here, at one time he stops really dealing with Israel and starts to set up his church, starts to train his disciples, starts getting them ready, starts the parables, and he's setting up. His church. He's starting to establish his church because his people had rejected him. And it's going to be postponed till the church age is over, or if I'm going to call it the age of grace. When the church age is over, when the last person saved or uh, comes to know him, or whatever time frame God has for it, if it's a time frame, or the last believer, whenever that happens, and that's over, and all that happens in the seven years, and that's over, then the kingdom will come you see Israel's time starts again when the church is raptured and at the end of that period God's going to bring in his kingdom and all of us that are in heaven with him are going to come back with him all the saints all of us are going to come back with him and we're going to rule with him at that time so it's postponed until all that is then the kingdom was proclaimed in uh, Revelation chapter 10, the, the angels proclaimed it. Moses and Elijah proclaimed it. So we see it's proclaimed. Postponed, it was proclaimed. Sixth, the kingdom was plagiarized. And we're going to study this when we get to Revelation 13. You see, the devil will do everything he can to copy the kingdom of Christ. That's why you have the Antichrist and he's trying to rule and everything's eh, kind of great, not really great in the first three and a half. And then he turns on them in the last three and a half. And it really becomes devastating. The worst time in history. And Christ had to come back. But see, he's trying. He's trying to copy it and trying to get, he comes as a rider of the white horse, trying to bring peace and all, but then he turns and does the sword, brings famine and everything else. You see, he's trying to copy the kingdom. But he can't do it. He's always a day late and a dollar short. Probably be a thousand dollars short now with the economy increase. Whatever. 
Okay. Now, they were the, number seven, the last one, the kingdom is perfected. When Christ comes back to this earth and brings in his own kingdom, he's going to answer the prayer in Matthew chapter 6, thy kingdom come. We're going to have a perfect divide. We read it out of Isaiah. We're, uh, we're, there'll be no more war. Um, all of that's going to happen. You're going to have peace. And all that's going to happen. The We're going to have a perfect environment, a perfect kingdom. No disease, no sin. Wow. What a period of time. We throw seed out there in the garden, it's going to grow. The fruit, the estimates of scientists said the group was probably that big because there's nothing to keep it from growing. You know, we have to manipulate it and throw miracle grow and everything to make a, a pumpkin bigger or something. Not then. No, we're not going to eat any of that. It's going to be perfect environment. Isn't that going to be great when he comes back? And so everything's going to be done. And we're going to come back with him. And we're going to help him. Now, now there are five uh, points or issues connected with the kingdom of Christ uh, that I wanted to talk about here. And, and the first is the character of God. Now, Everybody says, well, you know, oh, it's been over 2,000 years. It's been all this time. You know, God's not really coming back. You know, he says this. Well, wait a minute. This, the first issue or first point is, this has to deal with the character of God. God says, I'm going to establish my kingdom. Is he going to do that? Yes, he's going to do that. He said he was. Now, if he doesn't do that, then that makes God lying. And God cannot lie. Titus tells you that, the book of Titus. God cannot lie. And if God could lie, how do you know your salvation is okay? Hmm. God cannot lie. God says, I'm coming back. Is God going to keep his word? Yes, he is. The Bible says yes, but guess what? The post-millennial says no. The amillennial say no. You see, he won't keep his world. But the premillennial says yes. See, so the character of God is on the line here. And Christ will come back and reign for a thousand years. God said it's going, he's going to do it, and it's going to happen. So the first issue you have with the first uh, uh, point is it's the character of God that's at stake. God cannot lie. Number two. There are four unconditional covenants. Covenants to Israel. And the first one we have is the Abrahamic. Abrahamic. Abrahamic covenant. I, man, I tell you what, I can't get those last amics out. Anyway, I just stuck a little under the tongue. A great nation and all the people will be blessed during do it's doing that now that's that covenant we're all blessed why because of of abraham and the line of abraham we have david we have christ and of course if you even do joseph joseph comes from the line of david around there a different section that you'll just see in the bible uh in, in matthew and luke both of those genealogies mary and joseph are there but a great nation and all the people will be blessed that's a covenant Unconditional. You don't have to do anything. That's what unconditional means. You don't do anything. It's all on God. And God cannot lie. So we see it come through there. Then we have the Palestinian covenant, which is real estate. And I will give you this land forever. It's not yet. God's going to call them back, and they're all going to go there during the millennial period. We're probably going to be over in Jerusalem, but they're going to get all that land back. And God, God promised them an unconditional covenant. Then we have the Davidic covenant. The son of David will sit on the throne forever and ever. Christ, his greater son, is going to be the one who sits on the throne. When Christ comes back and he sets up that millennial kingdom, basically you may call it another, but after the millennial kingdom, and the white throne judgment, we move right into the eternal kingdom. So basically it lasts forever. It's just moved on. Okay? So you have that covenant. Then we have the new covenant. 
to the Jew. Every Jew will believe in Jesus Christ. You see, their veil will be lifted from their eyes during the tribulation period. It's finally going to come off on all of them. Yes, my wife is Jewish, and we know some other Jewish believers now, but they're not coming now because there's still a veil there. And they're still setting up to, to do the worship in the temple and all that right now. But they're not coming to Christ in groves. Okay, they are coming. But during this time, during the tribulation period, the veil is going to be lifted. And millions and millions of Jews are going to believe. That new covenant is going to believe. And these covenants will be carried out. God keeps his word. And all of those are going to be carried out. Now, the other uh, point or issue, maybe I should say issue, is the dispersion of Israel. Because of Israel rejecting Christ, in 70 A.D., Titus, he wasn't the emperor yet, he was the son of the emperor, destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and scattered all of them. He took 100,000 Jews back to Rome, and the, the Arch of Titus is there. It's history, it's proven, it's happened. And the Jews have been scattered all over the world ever since then. 1948, yes, I know the Jews are going back. Some are going back now. But they're not all going back. Our American Jews don't want to go back. They don't, they don't want to be over there where, where, where maybe it's a possibility of having a lot of hostilities. Of course, they're starting to get it now. But they don't want to go back. The American Jew is different. But in the end, God's going to call them, and they are going to go back. They're going to stay out of the world until God calls them back. Does the Jew have a future? What does this say? Yes. These are God's chosen people. And he keeps his word. And he is not done with the Jewish nation yet. The time clock starts again for the seven years that God promised them. And he cannot lie. So he's got to give them back that seven years. He has to because he cannot lie. They still have a future. They're still as God's people. Yes, the church were his bride. But he has not forgotten Israel. If he could give up on Israel and not fulfill his promises, then he wouldn't have to fill his promises to you and me as believers or the church. But chew on that one for a while. For those that think that the church has replaced it, Israel, no. Basically, for evangelizing the world about Christ, yes, the church has replaced them in that perspective. But then you have a lot of Jews that are preaching the gospel of Christ too. So it has not replaced uh, Israel and, and God's favored people and stuff. Okay, number number four the issue is the second advent. That is just the second time Christ. Christ is going to return on this earth. It said it's part of history. The Bible says he's going to come. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 12, I think. Chapter 12, verse 14, somewhere around there. It says he's going to come back and stand on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split. And you're going to have a water harbor in, in Israel because of that. But anyway, he's going to come back. His second advent. He physically stands on the earth. The rapture is not an advent of Christ. He calls us. We meet him in the air. Some people want to say because he's come back, that's a third time. No, he does not come to the earth. He calls us. We meet him in the clouds at the rapture. Now, the Bible says he's going to come back. Guess what? The devil says, no, he isn't. He says, I will never permit this to happen, the devil says. I am the ruler of this world. I already told you that. Matthew voids that in, in 2 Corinthians. He is the ruler of this world. He says no, but the Bible says yes. The same Jesus that went up to heaven, ascended to heaven, when disciples watched him, he will come back to that same spot on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and he will rule from there. Amen. How about that? And we're going to come back with him. Isn't that neat? Number five is the millennium. Will Christ reign for a thousand years? The Bible says yes. And let me jump back here to Revelation uh, chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. And I saw an angel come down from heaven. Yeah. Down from heaven, with the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, Satan. Um, that's what's one of his names for, Drakon in the Greek. That old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. He cast him into the bottom of his pit and shut him up and set a, a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Till the thousand years. There's your thousand years reign. Once you saw it in verse 2, a thousand year reign. 
Number two, the thousand-year reign should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed for a short time. That's the second time. And I saw the thrones and them that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, either guillotine or sword, and for the word of the Lord, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ, what, a thousand years, a third time. And, of course, uh, Daniel 9 and, and like that. And it says, but, but verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. And the liberty brought forth the white throne judgment, a thousand years. Again, uh, this is the fourth time. A thousand years. Finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part of the first resurrection. And there's a whole thing about that that I'm not going to get into right now. Different parts of the first resurrection. And such, the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him, what, a thousand years, there's number five. And when the thousand years, number six, are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. You see, I mean, it, it tells us it's there. This second, it, it's going to happen. He is going to reign for a thousand years. Now, the post millennial, all millennials say no. Premillennials say yes. Yeah. See, six times in one chapter. Not to mention the Old Testament. The Bible says yes, Christ is going to reign for a thousand years. God keeps his word. Does he? Yes. Now we come to the 11 characteristics of the thousand year reign of Christ. The millennial period. What are they? Revelation 15. Whoops. And I saw another sign in heaven, a great and marvelous seven, seven angels having the seven last plagues of them that fell upon the earth wrath. And I saw, and it were, and I saw a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over the, his image and over the mark and over the number of name, but that his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou hast art thou art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle, the testimony of heaven, was opened. And the seven angels came out of them, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girls. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seventh angel seven golden vials full of wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Well, ooh, I read, I read the whole fifth chapter 15, but I was supposed to read chapter verse 15 of chapter 11. Boy, I really got hit of myself, didn't I? And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world are become the kingdom of the Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Well, you just got a different piece of reading. That's where the plagues are going to be running. We'll get to it. it what, seven, the, the eleven characteristics, one, there's no religion. Religion is a curse to us, okay? Um... Religion leads us the wrong way. Religion makes us feel good. Religion has rules and regulations, and you do this and do that and do that, and it makes us feel good. But religion is a curse because it makes us think we're way we're getting to Christ. From Satan will be be chained, and Christ will be ruling, and Christianity will be the only thing that can. We can believe or not believe. No religion. Christianity is a relationship with God. That's the only thing 
that's there. And Christ is there. So that's the only thing is believing in Jesus Christ. No religion on the earth. There will be great spirituality, number two, on the earth. In Joel chapter 2, on that day there will be emotions, uh, ecstatic sayings and Christ and singing and Christ will be in control of it all. It's going to be great spirituality there. Three, Israel will be restored as a nation. Um, let me just go back to um, Isaiah. And just for Isaiah chapter 35. And we want to see verses 1 through 10. The wilderness and the solitary places shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice in the blossoms as a rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing and glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it. The excellency of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and affirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and as the tongue, a deer really, a tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out in the streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool in the thirsty land, springs of water, in the habitation of the dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men. Those fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any raven beast shall go up therein. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk therewith. Walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy. Upon their heads they shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Wow. You see, Israel will be restored. The ransom means born again Jews. That's what's going to be there. They're going to be restored as a nation. For to be no more war. There will be no need for the military academies, no need for our sons, no, no need, need for swords. swords. They're going to be beaten into plowshares. When Christ comes back, and sets up his millennial period. There will be no more war at all. We're going to have universal prosperity. You see, everybody will have enough. In Psalm 72, Isaiah 65, and others, you're going to have a golden, a golden pot with a chicken in it. You lose your pot, you just get another one. Everything's going to be there for us. There'll be no poverty at all, and no starving. There'll be. Perfect government, I like that. Perfect government under Christ. No favoritism. Okay, no political favors. Okay. But there will be capital punishment, though. It says that anyone that, that does anything wrong, the people, the only way they're going to die is if, with capital punishment because there is no disease, there is no sin. It's a perfect environment. That's the only way they die. There's going to be seven radical change in nature. Perfect weather. Perfect weather. You imagine that? No storms, no tornadoes, no hurricanes, no hail, no damn, no weather destruction. Perfect environment, no deserts. Eight, there's going to be universal knowledge of God. I love this. They shall know me from the least to the greatest. There's no need to be able to tell our neighbors. There's, we're not going to have to go out and child evangelist. Church not going to have to stay on street corners. She's not going to have to use her blue cards to witness to people anymore. Won't have to tell him because it's going to be universal knowledge. He's going to be ruling. He's going to be there and everybody's going to know who he is. You won't need to do that. They will all know who Christ is. Everyone. 
Another one, there's going to be perfect justice or judgment, whatever you want to say. It's got a, uh, Isaiah again in chapter 11. And we're going to see this in, in verses 3 and 4. It says, And shall make him, Jesus, of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his, hearing of his, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equality for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Now that's that capital punishment. So you're going to have perfect judgment, perfect justice is going to be there. Now, blending up the beginning of the millennial period, number 10, all unbelievers are removed. Now, at the beginning of tribulation, I believe all believers are removed for the rapture of the church, the bride of Christ. But the beginning of the millennial period, all unbelievers are removed. Satan is chained for a thousand years. They're all removed. When you see that thing, it's one taken and one remained. It's talking about the end of time, see. The ones that are taken are the unbelievers. The ones that remain are the believers, you see. So for that thousand year reign, it begins with all believers. It's the babies that are born later that Satan tempts. Even with Christ, as I said, that he reigns for a thousand years, starting with, with only believers in a perfect environment, people still won't believe. So you say, well then, what is, what is the purpose then of this? Well, I believe, so, I think the purpose is of the thousand years is to prove to people that the solution to their problems and to the world's problems and their problem is, is not no war, it's not perfect environment, it's not perfect climate, it's, that is not the solution. The problem is regeneration. In other words, salvation, belief in Christ, being regenerated in our lives by the Spirit of Christ. That's our problem. That's why all of this is to prove, even though Christ is sitting on the throne, uh, we're going to be ruling with him. People still aren't going to believe. Satan's being able to tempt them and take them off for a final battle. Because that isn't the answer, folks. The answer is Jesus Christ being regenerated, being born again, nothing else. See, Christ will rule for a thousand years to prove this. You see? And Satan is let loose from the change, and he gathers another battle, that final rebellion against Christ. To prove that, that isn't what we really need. We need Christ in our life. It says life will be extended. And you can go over to Isaiah 65, 17 through 20. No one dies during the millennium except those who will die by capital punishment. It says over there that, that a child will live to 100 years old. And only, only the fake will die. Age is no longer an issue. It's over. There's no pain, no disease, no war, perfect weather, all of this, and still some won't believe. You see, then judgment comes in the white throne judgment. And the book of works is open. They're judged by the book of works and they're put into the lake of fire. What about you? Is God's judgment going to come upon you? Because you haven't believed in him? You haven't accepted him in your life? It will if you haven't asked Jesus into your life. It's a personal relationship with him. It's your choice, not mine. It's yours. The only thing I'm called to do is bring you the information. You have the information. It's all up to you now whether you accept it and believe it and ask Christ to come into your life. Let me pray. Father, again, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that you've given us. Thank you for your word, Father. We just take it, Father. Help us to remember that we do need to tell those, Father, so they can come to the saving knowledge of you. And so, Father, we just pray for this. Use this, Father, as your tool. Father, just watch over God and direct us and help us, Father, to celebrate the true meaning of Christmas, your birth, the time that you decide to come down here to earth and go to the cross of Calvary for us to take the penalty of our sin and give us, Father, eternal life. We thank you for that. And for these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I know I didn't.